you never take your eyes off the president. Never be caught without your camera ready. March 30th, 1981, President Ronald Reagan woke up that day and he had one public event on his schedule, which was a speech at the Washington Hilton Hotel. There was a crowd there. It was an enthusiastic crowd. He came walking out and uh, I made, made one or two frames. I'm off the president's right shoulder. First shot, he grimaced and that's when I pushed the shutter. Somebody's shooting at me. Ooh. Somebody's shooting me, I gotta shoot back. People screaming, people running, sirens. The president is code city, meaning he's going to die. That day changed everything. You can't live scared. <laughs> you just, you, you put your trust and confidence in those who are assigned the job of protecting you and put it in the back of your mind, go about your business. I got into photography purely as a, a fluke. I was, uh, I'd been working for the telephone company and going to college, and uh, I had a spare class, and I took a photography course. Went to the photo instructor who I'd become friends with, who had been a, a news photographer before becoming a professor. And I told him I wanted to become a, a press photographer. So he started working for me. And so what we started doing is every morning I'd come in, he'd give me an assignment, and he wanted to print back in his hand in an hour. And I built up a good portfolio, and then UPI offered me a job back in California. And that's when I started covering Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the son of an alcoholic shoe salesman who grew up in the Great Depression. There was something innate in Ronald Reagan that he wanted to succeed. And he went to Eureka College, and there he caught the acting book. So Reagan realizes his life is in the movies or performance or radio, and he eventually finds his way to a radio station in Iowa, where he broadcasts Major League Baseball games. And then he goes to Hollywood and is a very successful B-level actor. He appeared in about 50 films. He does that, he becomes the head of the Screen Actors Guild, a union, so he's a union guy. In California, actor Ronald Reagan and Mrs. Reagan arrive to cast their votes in the state's primary election. Then eventually becomes governor of California. Over this time, his politics evolve. He was a diehard Democrat in his younger years. He becomes a staunch Republican. He runs for president in 1976 and loses. He took on Jerry Ford for the Republican nomination. 1980 comes around and people thought he was too old to do it. At 69, he's by far the oldest candidate. And no president has ever won the White House at that age. And he ran for office. And he won. He beat Carter, an incumbent president. I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. The 60s, early 70s, early 80s was a time there was a lot of political violence. At 125, the motorcade moves into the downtown area. In a warehouse, a sniper with a rifle poised waits. The assassin's aim is deadly. The man who fought against violence is by violence destroyed. Destroyed by an assassin's bullet at Memphis, Tennessee. The name Martin Luther King underlines the significance of Robert Kennedy's death to all the underprivileged in America. A lot of like, deranged people, not just that, but for political motivations, people took these steps. The president was moving down the line of people. I couldn't see what she was doing. They should have known, at least, that she was a dangerous person. What went wrong? When you're trying to establish the secure environment for the president, you're trying to replicate all the security measures you actually have at the White House. There's never an adversarial relationship between the press and the Secret Service. There are instances whereby there are challenges from the standpoint that the press would like to be in a more advantageous position than the Secret Service will allow. I was taught real quick, you never take your eyes off the president. So it doesn't mean you have to be shooting pictures all the time, but if you're off to the side, never be caught without your camera ready. So you're looking for usually on a day when you're covering the president, two or three pictures a day from that event. So you're looking for pictures that are going to tell as much of the story as you can. The Secret Service, in carrying out its protective responsibilities, follows a philosophy of prevention. 
clearly there has to be contingency if all things don't go as planned. March 30th, 1981, basically the 70th day of Ronald Reagan's first term, and things hadn't been going particularly well for him politically. He was getting buffered around. He woke up that day, and he had one public event on his schedule, which was a speech to the AFL-CIO Building and Construction Trades Department at the Washington Hilton Hotel as a convention. It was a 2 o'clock speech. It was a very short distance from the White House. It's not like planning a big on-the-road trip. He was just going to go speak there for 30 minutes and go back to the White House. Well, ironically, it was only my second day covering the White House for the Associated Press. I had gone to the White House probably about 6 o'clock in the morning and, and uh, read all the clips, what was going on. The briefing that of the agents was going to take place at approximately an hour and a half prior to the president's arrival. He goes to give the speech. And it's a fine speech. He cracks some jokes. He gives a good speech about crime. He issues the call, let's make America great again. I proceed the president uh, to, from the hotel uh, to the limo. As soon as he walked off stage, everybody got up. Well, we were down below, and we had to go across the hall up two flights of escalators. I was just having to say, excuse me, excuse me, I've got to go. I'm going with the president. Excuse me. And I was one of the first ones to get up to the top. The president takes a few steps toward the limousine. He came walking out, and uh, I made, made one or two frames. I'm off the president's right shoulder. I thought it was firecrackers. First shot, he grimaced, and that's when I pushed the shutter down. I remember as clear as day. I was like, somebody shooting at me. Ooh, somebody shooting at me, I gotta shoot back. The first bullet hits Jim Brady, the press secretary head. He falls to the ground. The second shot hits Tom Delahanty, a DC police officer in the back. He falls to the ground. Jerry Paul, 50 year old head of the Secret Service detail is reacting in about four tenths of a second. There's actually only three frames where you can see the president's face. The other five frames, he's been pushed into the car by Jerry Parr, the, the lead agent. The gun starts tracking Reagan from right to left as he's diving into the limousine. I was able to get a sight picture on that individual but I hesitated to fire because I thought at the time with an agent come across my line of fire. The fourth shot hits Tim McCarthy, a Secret Service agent, in the chest, not wearing a bulletproof vest. He falls to the ground. <laughs> people screaming, people running, sirens. I then proceeded as my partner, as well as other agents, to the assailant to contain this individual. This shot hits the window of the bulletproof limousine as Parr and Reagan flash behind him. The sixth shot cracks across the driveway, a door slam shot. Once the car pulled away, I saw Officer Delahanty, McCarthy, a Secret Service agent, laying on the ground, and then a very good friend of mine, Jim Brady, the press secretary, lay in there, and he was, you know, probably one of the worst sights I've ever seen because it was a good portion of, of his head that just wasn't pleasant to see. Once we were able to get the handcuffs on the assailant and take custody of the weapon. My concern was, was this a diversion? Was there a secondary attack that could happen here? Jerry puts the president back up in the seat, checks him, the president says, I think I'm OK. You kind of hurt my rib, throw me in the car. We had our guy. We had the guy who fired the shots at the president and caused others to be wounded. There's Jerry Parr in the limousine with the president, telling the driver to hightail it out of there. The driver, meanwhile, is praying he doesn't run over his friend, Tim McCarthy, who's on the ground. Once in the car, we have an individual, white male, anywhere from 25 to 30 years of age, was very stoic, uh, didn't say much at all. Jerry gets on the radio and says, Rawhide is OK. Follow up. Rawhide is OK. Rawhide was Reagan's Secret Service code name. He loved that code name. We're going to ground. The code name for the White House, or taken off the White House. Back to the White House. Back to the White House. Reagan has reached into his pocket, pulled out a napkin he took from the hotel, dabbed his lips, and there's bright, flothy blood. I gave the film to Ira, and he took it back immediately to the AP. And Frank Johnson, the Washington Post, 
had had his car there, and he drove me back to the White House. Hart decides, I have a decision to make. Take the president to the White House, or do I risk it and go to the hospital, where there's no security? Go on, Roger, we want to go to the emergency room. Uh, George Washington. Diverts the hospital. We subsequently got a complaint from the assailant as we moved further toward our destination of the cuffs being on too tight. Uh, my partner explained to him that in certain expletives that they weren't on too tight and that we weren't going to loosen them. They're there from the time of the shooting to the get to the hospital three minutes. They pull up and Reagan insists on walking inside himself. Reagan's eyes roll in the back of his head and he collapsed like a dead weight into the arms of his agents. His paramedic said, oh my God, the president is code city, meaning he's going to die. After photographer Ron Edmonds caught the moment President Reagan was shot. Even at that point, I thought it was firecrackers. He grimaced and that's when I pushed the shutter down. The life of the 70-year-old hung in the balance at the George Washington Hospital. A surgical intern who had fought in Vietnam, been wounded in Vietnam, shows up and looks down. And is that a, I think he's been shot. They rush him into surgery. They finally let Nancy Reagan in to the ER to check him out. And she, she was distraught. And Reagan saw that in her. And he says, honey, I forgot to duck. Cracks a joke. They finally find the bullet at just an inch from his heart. It stopped an inch from his heart. As Dr. Ben Aaron is hunting for the bullet in Reagan's chest, frantically trying to find it because he's worried it could slip into an artery and shoot into the president's brain and kill him, Dr. David Adelberg reaches his hand into the president's chest, gently cups the president's beating heart in his hand and nestles it aside. A 31-year-old surgical intern literally held the beating life of the president in his hand. When something like this happens, that's when it really comes home that, you know, you are in harm's way on any given day as you carry out the day-to-day -day responsibilities of your job. Reagan pulled through. They saved him. He goes to the recovery room, and he begins writing these notes to his nurses. Like, all in all, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. Send me to LA where I can see the air I'm breathing. The one time you can't fake it is the day you've been shot, OK? That was the real person. People like that. They like the courageous leader. They like the guy staring death in the face and laughing at it, cracking jokes. Once uh, the FBI took custody of the assailant, I was given direction from my supervisors that I would be the agent that would write the affidavit for the arrest. John Hinckley had, in 1976, gone to Hollywood to try to be a songwriter, failed miserably, but fell in love with a movie, Taxi Driver. Jodie Foster had gone to Yale, and John Hinckley stalked her. He, like, left notes at her door. He called her on the phone, going, hey, Jody, I want to get together with you. How are you doing? Once he called, and he heard giggling in the background. He said, Jody, what are they laughing at? She goes, they're laughing at you. Anyway, he's like, you know, how can I impress Jodie Foster? I'm going to get the president of the United States. That's how I'm going to impress Jodie Foster. I'm going to kill the president. I thought I was in huge trouble because I knew that I never saw Hinckley's face. They immediately pulled his jacket up over his head and uh, to kind of incapacitate him, and they took him to a car. My first sign of what I had made was that back then we had the Washington Star, which was an afternoon paper, and it came out and it was delivered to the White House, and there were my pictures on the front page. Hal Buell, who's a wonderful director of photography for the AP, the first words out of his mouth was a phone call to me and said, kid, you nailed it. Three shots that become iconic photos of America, where you can tell the vulnerability of the president in that moment. Like, if you look at that picture in Reagan's face. Throughout that day, there was a lot of confusion. Al Haig had had a lot of tension with Reagan's people. He wanted to run the show. They're in this small room, the Situation Room, and they're trying so hard to figure out what's going on. And they look up, and there's Larry Speaks, the deputy press secretary, Jim Brady, on the television, dodging questions that make it look like he doesn't know what he's talking about. Al Haig charges into the press room, where he issues this so famous comment. I'm in charge now. Of course, that 
ended up biting him in the end because he really wasn't in charge, but uh, he kind of took a bad rap for that. Vice president obviously is number two, but you know, again, they weren't prepared for this. The camera I used the day of the assassination attempt was a, a Nikon F3, which was pretty much the standard uh, news camera at the time, and it's a, a wonderful camera. It shoots, I think it's six frames a second, which that was what helped me get the, the sequence. And it's a, it's a film camera, no, no back on it to look at your pictures. You had to wait till it, it got processed and came out of the dark room. So it's, you had a, a, a long gulp waiting to see whether or not you've gotten the picture. <laughs> the whole set of pictures, as you can imagine, got an enormous amount of play. I mean, it was on the cover of Newsweek. I was on the cover of, of Perry Match. Uh, I was on practically every newspaper. Jerry Parr, who was the lead agent, said, you know, you're very lucky. And I said, well, why? He said, well, all the shots hit either the car, him, or somebody, with the exception of one shot, which went across the street and hit a building over there. You came very close, because it looks like the bullet went about a foot over your head. On the 11th of April, 1981, President Reagan returned to the White House. It said he was wearing a bulletproof vest under his shirt. Now, if you go to the Hilton Hotel, where he walked out the door, it's now a garage, which they call the Hinkley Garage, because the, any dignitaries that come there now drive into the garage, and it's got a door that shuts, so you don't see them. We used to think nothing of stopping at a street corner if the president wanted to go shake hands and get out and walk around with people. Those days have changed. None of us wore our body armor that day, and I think that is a direct result, at least my assessment, that was a direct result of complacency. This day changed everything in presidential protection. Go ahead, go. The three things that came out of this particular incident had to do with magnetometer screening, uh, covered arrivals and departures, and subsequently the implementation of having a special agent at the hospitals, the primary hospitals. After, you know, a couple months and people talking and what was going on, it was obvious that that was going to have a potential to win a Pulitzer Prize. I got up one morning, and uh, the news says, the Pope's been shot. And I look, and here's a picture of a gun coming out of the crowd and the Pope being shot. And I thought, oh, man, I'm going to have to compete with that now. I got a call from New York saying, uh, we hear you're in the finals. They don't make an announcement until April 15th uh, every year. And they would say so we had a teletype machine, and it's, it's listing the winners. There it popped up, and of course, the whole bureau, everybody in the bureau was watching, and champagne broke out. I mean, it's the Academy Award of my business. And uh, I never in a million years thought I would have a chance at winning a Pulitzer Prize. The president invited me into the Oval Office. With the exception of Jim Brady uh, and the others being shot, he actually kind of, I got the impression that he kind of thought it was pretty macho, you know. The guy took a shot at me, and I took the bullet, and I survived it. And uh, he joked it at one point at the end. He said, you know, this time, I think if you say, Governor, look this way, I'm going to have a stand-in next time. <laughs> I felt as though I had met the test. I was actually congratulatory to the agents that were there on the detail who were waiting to be interviewed based on the job that they did and the decisions that were made. Jerry Parr, the agent in charge, Ray Shattuck, the shift leaders, Tim McCarthy, who took the bullet for the president, received the Secret Service Medal of, of Valor. I received, along with a couple of my colleagues, the Treasury Department's uh, Award of Distinction. John Hickley went to trial in 1982 and was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Once the jury found he was not guilty by reason of insanity, he was sent to St. Elizabeth's Hospital, where he remained as a patient, basically, until 2016. Nearly 35 years after he tried to assassinate President Ronald Reagan, John Hinckley is spending an increasing amount of time at his mother's home in southeastern Virginia. Now, he did, over the years, get more and more freedom. He'd get visits to his mother in Williamsburg for 10-day stretches, 17-day stretches, things like that. But now he lives full-time in Williamsburg. And his attorney argues he's no longer a threat. But prosecutors disagree, saying he has a history of deceptive behavior. March 30th, 1981, changed the trajectory of Ronald Reagan himself, which changed the trajectory of his presidency. 
which changed the trajectory of the world. When I look at those images, basically it causes them to reflect back on the fact that, that I was in harm's way and that I was right in the line of fire. And I didn't realize that until I saw those images that, that Ron took. Edmonds captured this moment in perfect time. Like, it is frozen, and it's detailed. You see the look of fear on Reagan's face. You see the determination on Jerry Parr, the agent, as he's pushing him away. It's an incredible moment in, in, in photojournalism history. It was a high-intensity thing, and it's what we all work to do, the basic job of making sure that you cover every moment that you can to illustrate to people around, around the world uh, what happened that day. After September 11th, there was a fear that there was going to be another mass casualty attack. 3,000 Americans had died. The intelligence services thought, we missed this. And so there's the sense, how are we going to get the information next time? We will do anything. There is a moment of horror in looking at the fresh-faced thing, actually enjoying her cruelty. Study after study after study shows the torture doesn't work. That if you brutalize someone, what you're going to get back is the answer that they think that you want to hear, because they'll say anything to stop you brutalizing them. We didn't torture people. That was the image that we had of ourselves as countries and of a way of life and a civilization. I was actually in New York about a mile away from the World Trade Center when the second plane hit. On September the 11th, 2001, America came under attack. A major disaster is occurring in New York City this morning. Terrorists hijacked four commercial planes, causing devastation and destruction, the like of which the world had never seen before. Almost 3,000 people died, making it the deadliest attack ever on American soil. After September 11th, there was a fear that there was going to be another mass casualty attack. 3,000 Americans had died. And so there was an, a sense of urgency, a sense that we've got to get the information and prevent the next one happening. It cannot be overstated that the intelligence services thought we missed this. And so there's the sense, how are we going to get the information next time? We will do anything. The people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Most of New York was shut down to traffic, so you couldn't drive anywhere. So people were walking everywhere. And the sense that you got was a sense of solidarity and grief rather than any kind of jingoistic or militaristic uh, will to revenge. What is interesting, however, is the speed with which Dick Cheney, the vice president of the US, took control of that moment and transformed what was uh, truly a horrendous moment of grief and loss and transformed it into an occasion for settling scores against Iraq in particular. The Al-Qaeda attacks prompted President George Bush to declare a war on terror. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. So you've got George Bush standing up and saying, they, the others, hit us, so you go and hit them. When the president says go, look out, it's hammer time. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger.
major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. However, by autumn 2003, the Americans were facing a growing number of insurgents fighting against them and changed tactics. The US military begins large-scale sweeps of populations, and they're specifically looking for military-aged males, and they were putting them in detention centers. One of the most feared prisons under Saddam Hussein was Abu Ghraib. In 1984, something like three to 4,000 prisoners, uh, Iraqi prisoners, who had chosen to challenge Saddam from within the Ba'ath Party had been executed in Abu Ghraib prison. So the prison already had a horrendous reputation. We didn't torture people. That was the image that we had of ourselves as countries and of a way of life and a civilization. Suddenly, these photographs appeared that showed behavior that was inhuman, that was the worst kind of behavior that you expected your worst enemies to use. They were made to stand on collapsible cardboard boxes, and they were threatened that if the cardboard collapsed under them, they would be uh, punished. That image of the hooded figure is something horrifying. The fear of the dark is one of the most primitive things that we have. The image is seen from the viewpoint of the torturer. I think that when we look at it, we actually identify with the tortured, and I think that that, in part, is the element of empathy that brings that image so much closer to us as something that affects us, as something that makes us remember it. The man is standing on the box. He's got the hood over his head. His arms are stretched out, and there are wires. Told to hold an incredibly painful position, and if you move, you will die. After September the 11th, 2001, the American public were told by President Bush that the US was going to war with Iraq because of the imminent threat of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction and ties to terrorism. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. To combat the threat of insurgents, the US began to detain suspects in various prisons. The most infamous was Abu Ghraib. Yet a series of photos taken behind closed doors was about to shock the world. It was never, of course, intended that the photograph should be made public. But the chain of command in the military were totally aware of the existence of these photographs before they broke onto the world stage. You look at the full set of Abu Ghraib photographs, not just the hooded man, but the ones with the soldiers in them, is that these are almost like souvenir shots. You've got Lindy England with her thumbs up in front of a pile of naked detainees, for example. There's a moment of horror in looking at the fresh-faced thing, actually enjoying her cruelty. And I think that that element of recognition is perhaps what makes these images so powerful to us. Over the years, I represented a lot of people who were swept up in the war on terror, detained without charge or trial, and tortured in exactly the same ways that you would see at Abu Ghraib. So you're talking about total brutalization. You say a stress position twisting someone's arms behind them, putting them in a position that is absolute agony and forcing them to hold that position, depriving them of sleep. And, you know, studies show you don't have to deprive someone of sleep for a very long time at all before they basically lose their minds. How would the Americans feel if this happened to them by Iraqis in America? The worldwide reaction to the photos cast America into confusion. We don't torture detainees. That's not, that's not anybody's uh, playbook. And anger. This is a disgrace. And more than that, it is a crime. From abroad. <laughs> and at home.
People are calling for your resignation. Somebody is drafting an article of impeachment against you right now. Do you have the ability, in your opinion, to come to Capitol Hill and carry the message and carry the water for the Department of Defense? Needless to say, if I felt I could not be effective, I'd resign in a minute. Um, I would not resign simply because people try to make a political issue out of it. When somebody was uh, writing about how perhaps it could potentially be uh, not a very good thing for uh, prisoners to be kept standing for eight hours, Rumsfeld has famously handwritten a note on the margin that says, um, I spend eight hours a day on my feet. Why shouldn't they? America would now have to deal with the fact that some of their soldiers had abused detainees. Study after study after study shows the torture doesn't work. That if you brutalize someone, what you're going to get back is the answer that they think that you want to hear, because they'll say anything to stop you brutalizing them. That tells you a lot about the culture that was set, again, right at the top by George Bush, but how it had trickled down the chain of command right down to the level of the private there. The people involved who suggested that we should make sure they get the treatment must be held accountable. So must anyone up the chain of command be held accountable. It was obviously one of those world media moments where everybody is shocked and everybody is disgusted. But again, to get out front of it, what did the military say? I don't believe that the culture of, of abuse existed in my command. I believe that we have isolated incidents that have taken place. They didn't say, we're going to revisit this horrible culture of abuse that does go to the top. They said, it's a few bad apples. This doesn't reflect who we are. All of these reservists appear in the photographs that are shocking because they show uh, a direct and deliberate and intentional will to humiliate and terrorize the detainees. I would like to personally apologize to the people of Iraq uh, for the actions of the small number of leaders and soldiers who violated our policy and may have uh, committed criminal acts. We are investigating those acts as rapidly as possible. As soon as it was found out that they were involved in this, they were instantly suspended and given no ability to go back into that prison um, as a guard. The United States uh, said it was coming to Iraq to put an end to an era uh, of torture. And now in the same prison, having American soldiers uh, do that, I think it is contrary to the spirit of the American people. They were behaving like the worst kind of people in a horror film. On March 19, 2004, President Bush asked, who would prefer the Saddam's torture chambers still be open? Shamefully, we now learn that Saddam's torture chambers reopened under new management, U.S. management. In recent days, there has been a good deal of discussion about who bears responsibility for the terrible activities that took place at Abu Ghraib. These events occurred on my watch. As Secretary of Defense, I am accountable for them, and I take full responsibility. Rather than somebody at the top who set that culture, who made a permissive environment that filtered down to thousands upon thousands of soldiers, rather than that person being held responsible. When the outcry over Abu Ghraib happens, and everybody says there's got to be a head rolling for this, they only go for the people at the very bottom of the food chain. They go for Lindy England. She's the one who gets court-martialed. Nothing happens to George Bush. Only the people who followed their lead. Can I take a picture of you? Sure, hurry. Have a camera I want a picture with her. Under a barrage of criticism at home and abroad, the White House dispatched Donald Rumsfeld on a charm offensive to the region. In recent months, we've seen abuses here under our responsibility. And it's been a body blow for all of us. But it doesn't represent America. It doesn't represent American values. It doesn't represent the values of you, each of you here in this room. I know that, you know that, your families know that. 
Although there had been talk about torture, there's nothing like seeing what that brutality looks like to make people understand. And I think people were shocked. Rumsfeld to resign his position and to apologize to not only the American people for, uh, uh, for lying to us, but also to the Iraqi people and the rest of the people in the world. We've been through a very difficult period, particularly with the the, the, the terrible uh, events at Abu Ghraib prison, which have rightly been condemned by everybody. But it's worth pointing out, it's also America that's putting $20 billion into Iraq to help Iraqi people. The other thing that the Abu Ghraib photograph did, I think, was teach the people in power in the United States, you've got to stop information like this coming out. And they fought harder to suppress those kind of leaks afterward. In April 2009, the Obama administration said it would not oppose the release of new photos documenting the abuse of prisoners in Iraq and Afghanistan. By May, the administration had a different view. Those who are arguing for the release of the photograph simply on the basis of transparency don't make a compelling case. It's therefore my belief that the publication of these photos would not add any additional benefit to our understanding of what was carried out in the past by a small number of individuals. In fact, the most direct consequence of releasing them, I believe, would be to further inflame anti-American opinion and to put our troops in greater danger. The fact that the Obama administration have chosen not to pursue the politicians that were involved in normalizing these activities also means that essentially Abu Ghraib is a horrendous document of a moment of atrocity that has been largely forgotten. Obama comes in to office in 2009, and he thinks there needs to be a coming together and a healing. So he says, on torture, we've got to look forward and not back. Nobody who really set that culture and made torture possible is going to pay for it. And I think that lack of accountability, the lack of anybody other than the very most junior people being held responsible, is why the culture is still as messed up as it is. In the and what comes out of all of this is that 11 people uh, are court-martialed and convicted. The couple that get several years in prison are Charles Grainer. The other person is Lindy England. A single officer, Steve Jordan, is also convicted, but what he is convicted of is neither torture nor illegal interrogations, but of disobeying the order to stay silent and not to speak to the special rapporteurs that were investigating this. I don't think that you would get exactly an Abu Ghraib now, not least because people in the military know that the war in Iraq and the torture photographs did more to put American soldiers at risk than probably anything in the past 30, 40 years. There's a reason why we signed these treaties, to protect my son in the military. That's why we have these treaties. So when Americans are captured, they are not tortured. That's the reason, in case anybody forgets it. That's the reason. The Americans themselves were absolutely horrified because apart from anything else of just disapproving of it as a human being. The United States represents what things should be, not what they shouldn't. And I think this is what they shouldn't be. It was the worst propaganda weapon that they could have handed the enemy. Sometimes a photo grabs the imagination. Abu Ghraib absolutely did it. Where we've been talking about an issue, columns and inches of print have been spilled over an issue, but suddenly everybody sees it for what it really is and what we have become. And sometimes that creates a momentum for change. I think it kind of opens a window for people and makes us look at ourselves. The effect of those Abu Ghraib pictures, paradoxically, has been to give succor to those who want to engage in torture elsewhere and who can now show the US having committed it to and therefore feeling justified to do it. Very few people will now argue that it was some kind of just war. And why is that? It's because people saw what it looked like. They saw the brutality of it. So in that sense, the Abu Ghraib photographs really did change the world. I think, why is Iraq now a watchword for misadventure of 
George Bush and his administration and other people who participated in the war in Iraq. I think a lot of it has to do with the pictures from Abu Ghraib. <laughs>